Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to the Schlumberger Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, there will be an opportunity for your questions, and instructions will be given at that time. If you should require assistance, please press star, then zero, and we will assist you offline. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to the Vice President of Investor Relations, N.D. Madhu Amazia. Please go ahead. Thank you, Leah. Good morning, and welcome to the Slumberger Limited third quarter 2021 earnings conference call. Today's call is being hosted from the Slumberger Dole Research Center in Boston, following the Slumberger Limited board meeting held earlier this week. Joining us on the call are Olivier Lepush, Chief Executive Officer, and Stéphane Biguet. Chief Financial Officer. Before we begin, I would like to remind all participants that some of the statements we'll be making today are forward-looking. These matters involve risks and uncertainties that could cause our results to differ materially from those projected in these statements. I therefore refer you to our latest 10K filing and our other SEC filings. Our comments today may also include non-GAAP financial measures. Additional details on reconciliation to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures can be found in our third quarter press release, which is on our website. With that, I'll turn the call over to Olivier. Thank you, Andy. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us on the call. In my prepared remarks today, I will cover three topics. Our third quarter results, our view of the near-term macro, and the exceptional growth opportunity ahead of us. I will then share some insights on the Middle East and offshore markets, and finally, a first view of the 2022 growth outlook. Stefan will then give more details on our financial results and will open the floor for questions. The third quarter results further emphasize our returns focus, consistent execution, and the advantage mix of our portfolio. Growth momentum was sustained, and we delivered a fifth consecutive quarter of margin expansion achieving the highest pre-tax operating margin since 2015 and cash flow from operations in excess of $1 billion. Let me share with you some performance highlights from the quarter across our core, digital, and new energy. In our core, first, margin expansion was led by well construction and reserve performance where we fully seized the sequential growth opportunity, driving operating margins in both these divisions above mid-teens, the highest levels in the last three years. Revenue quality improved, boosted by favorable activity mix and higher new technology uptake that delivered strong margin expansion. Second, internationally, we record a growth in all three areas, with revenue up 11% year on year, consistent with our ambition of double digit revenue growth compared to the second half of 2020. International margin further expanded, exceeding pre pandemic levels and are at the highest since 2018. In North America, revenue growth was sustained, albeit impacted by transitory supply and logistics disruption. Margin also continued to expand, with operating margins firmly at the budget shift. Finally, we are pleased with the very sizable activity pipeline secured during the quarter, through competitive tenders, direct awards, and contract extension, some of which include net pricing improvement building on our differentiated performance, integration capabilities, and technology. These wins enhance our market position, creating a long tail of activity and a platform to further new technology adoption and digital deployment, strengthening our leadership as we enter an exceptional growth cycle. We are delivering on the promise of our performance strategy, which is increasingly impacting our top and bottom line results, both in North America and internationally. As the cycle accelerates, we will leverage our advantage platform to capture the exciting growth and outperform the market in our core going forward. Moving to digital, we continue to progress our platform strategy this quarter, expanding our offering to the acquisition of independent data services and a strategic investment in DeepIQ to further advance our digital technology offering and the adoption of AI solutions in our industry. In digital production operations, we announced a partnership with Aveva to expand powerful edge and IoT solutions to the field, complementing our Agora platform and Sensia solutions. And in digital drilling, we successfully completed the first fully automated section drill offshore 
at the Hebron platform for ExxonMobil in Canada, as you have seen in this morning's earnings release. This achievement is a significant step for our industry, particularly offshore, and signals a momentous opportunity to apply digital technology to create a step change in well construction safety, performance, and carbon footprint. As shared recently, we are seeing the adoption of digital solutions accelerate in our industry. And whilst we are in the early innings, we are excited about the prospect of transitioning the majority of our software customer base of over 1,700 companies to our digital platform during the next few years. This growing adoption will generate an expanding set of digital revenue streams over a long horizon as we transition every customer to new digital solutions for the data, workflows, and operations. Moving to new energy, we advance our portfolio by taking a position in stationary energy storage to our strategic investment in Enervenu, a company with differentiated, differentiated metal hydrogen battery technology. This represents a new opportunity set and an expansion of total addressable market in a sector with significant growth opportunities. In geoenergy, following the success of the pilot in our technology facility in France, Celsius Energy has secured five commercial contracts in Europe. This is a significant achievement in the commercialization roadmap for Celsius as a low carbon solution for heating and cooling buildings, contributing to global efforts in reducing emissions. To conclude on this quarter performance, we once again demonstrate excellent progress in our strategy execution across our portfolio, supporting outstanding results. And I want to thank the entire Schlumberg team, not only for delivering another strong quarter, but for their unwavering effort to create enduring value for our customers and our shareholders. Now I would like to turn to the near-term macro and growth opportunity ahead of us. The market fundamentals have improved steadily throughout 2021, especially over the last few weeks, with oil and gas prices attaining recent highs, inventory at their lowest level in recent history, a rebound in demand, and encouraging trends in the pandemic containment efforts. This strengthening in industry fundamentals combined with the action of OPEC Plus and continued capital discipline in North America, I firmly established a prospect of an exceptional multi-year growth cycle ahead. In the international markets, all regions are set to benefit from this highly favorable environment, something not seen internationally since the last super cycle. This expansion will occur at different paces, across different basins, operating environments, and customer groups resulting in a sustained multi plunge growth cycle. Our broad exposure across these different dimensions put us in an advantage position to fully seize this growth opportunity. For example, this growth inflection is already visibly underway in Latin America, sparked by the resumption of exploration and the initiation of long cycle development campaigns. Activity has strengthened throughout 2021, and revenue in this market is already at 2019 pre-pandemic levels. Year-to-date revenue growth in Latin America is at 30%, with broad activity growth across multiple countries, including Argentina, Brazil, Ecuador, and Guyana. This growth is expected to strengthen further in the coming years due to ongoing long-cycle development campaigns. By contrast, in the Middle East, where activity has been more subdued in 2021, the market conditions are set for a material uptick of activity in the coming quarters. The combination of short cycle activity to meet supply commitments, strategic oil capacity expansion, and the acceleration of gas development projects will result in a significant increase in investment throughout 2022 and beyond. Our recent success in 10 awards, as detailed in our earnings release, strengthened our market position, and with our strong presence and commitment, will benefit the most from this exciting outlook in the region. In the offshore markets, we are also set for a strong resurgence this cycle. Real activity grew for the third sequential quarter internationally and is expected to build on a notable increase in development FIDs in the coming years. Advance in new technology, digital, and integration are driving performance impact offshore, from discovery to well construction, production, and recovery, and are creating the conditions for offshore operators to reinvest with confidence in this cycle. North America, the imminent resumption of lease sales in the Gulf of Mexico, where we have significant market presence, will drive additional offshore growth as operators capitalize on the advantage of this prolific basin 
and its existing takeaway infrastructure and extract more value from the core upstream position through exploration and tiebacks. Taking this factor together, a broad offshore resurgence will result from IOCs building on their advantage hubs, independent fast-tracking development on their recently acquired assets, and NOC unlocking their gas and oil reserves recovery potential. Our technology, digital enablement, and integration capability are critical advantage in this market environment and are resulting in significant new contract awards both internationally and in North America. Finally, we are extremely pleased with our customer reception of our transition technology portfolio and the accelerated adoption of this technology that reduced the carbon impact of oil and gas operations. This portfolio is focused on fugitive emissions, flaring, and electrification, and is already helping customers decarbonize operation, advancing, advancing our net zero ambition, and strengthening our sustainability leadership in the industry. Some examples of this impact are cited into our light. Turning to the fourth quarter outlook, directionally, we anticipate another quarter of growth with an ambition for growth across all divisions. Growth will be led by production systems and digital integration, benefiting from a year-end sales uplift tempered by, seasonal, by typical seasonality in reserve performance and well construction. This should result in an overall sequential growth rate similar to the prior quarter. With this fourth quarter outlook, we expect to reach our double-digit international growth ambition for the second half of 2021, when compared to the second half of 2020. It will also translate into full-year revenue growth both internationally and in North America after adjusting for the effect of divestiture. Building on third quarter operating margin and recent highs, our ambition is to sustain this level of margin performance in the fourth quarter. Consequently, on a full-year basis, we remain confident in attaining the high hand of our guidance of 250 to 300 BPS EBITDA margin expansion, an excellent foundation for expansion in the year ahead. Now I would like to close my prepared remarks with our earliest view of 2022. Against the backdrop of the constructive environment I described earlier, our confidence in the onset of an exceptional growth cycle is reinforced. At this early point in the planning cycle, an absence of setback in economic and pandemic recoveries, we anticipate very strong global upstream capital spending growth. This growth will impact all basins, every operating environment, short and long cycle activity, and all customer groups. In North America, we anticipate capital spending growth to increase around 20%, impacting both the onshore and offshore markets. Internationally, growth momentum will strengthen, and early indications point to strong capital spending growth in the low to mid teens, driven by both short cycle activity and the onset of multi-year capacity expansion plans. Through our performance strategy, we have strengthened our position across multiple dimensions. In North America, we have enhanced our market position and are biased to accretive growth onshore and would benefit from strong growth offshore in the Gulf of Mexico. And in the international market, we have built a multi-year pipeline of strong activity in the most prolific basins that will lead the supply response both in oil and gas. More importantly, we have enhanced our earning growth potential significantly, as demonstrated by multiple quarters of margin expansion. In North America, our operating margins are primed to exit the year at the highest level since 2015, which, combined with the favorable market position I just, I've just described, is an excellent platform for margin expansion. Internationally, we're also set for peer-leading margin expansion as we exit 2021 with margin above pre-pandemic levels. The combination of strong activity growth and operating leverage will support durable margin expansion. Additionally, to our fit for basin and transition technologies and capacity tightening, we see favorable conditions for broader net pricing net gains in the coming years in both North America and the international market. Finally, as a result of our digital platform strategy and growing customer adoption, we anticipate an acceleration of our digital journey resulting in accretive revenue and earning growth. Consequently, we expect margins to expand further in 2022, supporting material earnings growth potential, and are increasingly confident in achieving our mid-cycle adjusted EBITDA margin ambition of 25% or higher 
and sustaining a double digit free cash flow margin throughout the cycle. I will now pass the call to Stefan. Thank you, Olivier, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Third quarter earnings per share, excluding charges and credits, was 36 cents. This represents an increase of 6 cents compared to the second quarter of this year and an increase of 20 cents when compared to the same period of last year. In addition, we recorded in the third quarter a 3 cent gain relating to a startup company we had previously invested in. This company was acquired during the quarter and as a result, our ownership interest was converted into shares of a publicly traded company. Overall, our third quarter revenue of $5.8 billion increased 4% sequentially. Pre-tax operating margins improved 120 basis points to 15.5% and have now increased five quarters in a row. Margins expanded sequentially in three of our four divisions, with very strong incremental margin in both reservoir performance and well construction. This performance was due to a favorable geographic mix driven by continued international revenue growth, as well as a favorable technology mix with increased exploration and appraisal activity and new technology adoption. Company-wide adjusted EBITDA margin of 22.2% in the quarter increased 90 basis points sequentially. It is worth noting that this margin expansion was achieved despite the well-documented disruptions in global supply chain systems and inflation in select commodities and materials, as well as in logistics. Through our global supply chain organization, we are successfully engaging with our suppliers and customers to jointly navigate inflationary trends. We are collaborating with our customers to optimize planning and, where applicable, make the necessary adjustments through existing contractual clauses or negotiation. As a result, so far, we have largely been able to shield ourselves from the inflation effects. As the growth cycle accelerates, we will continue to be proactive, dynamically adjusting sourcing strategies, and leveraging our diverse global manufacturing footprint and supply network. Let me now go through the third quarter results for each division. Third quarter, digital and integration revenue of 812 million was essentially flat sequentially as lower sales of digital solutions were offset by higher APS revenue. Pre-tax operating margins increased 154 basis points to 35%, largely as a result of improved commodity pricing in our Canada APS project. Reservoir performance revenue of 1.2 billion increased 7% sequentially. This revenue growth was entirely driven by higher international activity. Margins expanded 202 basis points to 16%, largely due to higher offshore and exploration activity, as well as accelerated new technology adoption. Well construction revenue of 2.3 billion increased 8% sequentially due to higher land and offshore drilling, both internationally and in North America. Margins increased 230 basis points to 15.2% due to the higher drilling activity and a favorable geographical mix. Finally, production systems revenue of 1.7 billion was essentially flat sequentially while margins decreased 27 basis points to 9.9%. Now turning to our liquidity. Cash flow from operation was once again strong as we generated 1.1 billion of cash flow from operations and free cash flow of 671 million during the quarter. This represented a significant sequential increase when adjusting for last quarter's exceptional tax refund of 477 million. We paid $42 million of severance during the quarter. Excluding these payments, the working capital impact on our cash flow was neutral, despite the revenue increase. 
This was driven by a very strong DSO performance. We expect the fourth quarter to show another quarter of strong free cash flow generation, which positions us favorably to achieve our ambition of delivering full-year double-digit free cash flow margin. As a result of this strong cash flow performance, net debt decreased sequentially by 588 million to 12.5 billion. During the quarter, we made capital investments of 399 million. This amount includes capex, investments in APS projects, and multi clients. For the full year 2021, we are now expecting to spend approximately 1.6 billion on capital investments. In total, during the first nine months of the year, we have generated over $2.7 billion of cash flow from operations and $1.7 billion of free cash flow. As a result, we have been able to progress significantly on our commitment to deleverage the balance sheet. This is evidenced by the fact that gross debt has decreased by almost $1.5 billion since the beginning of the year net debt has reduced, has reduced by 1.4 billion during this same period. Overall, I am very pleased with our cash flow performance and the progress we are making towards strengthening the balance sheet. This will provide us with greater flexibility in our capital allocation. I will now turn the conference call back to Olivier. Thank you, Stéphane. So I think we are ready for the, the Q&A session. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, please press 1, then 0 on your telephone keypad. You will hear acknowledgement that your line has been placed in queue. You may also remove yourself from the queue by pressing 1, 0 again. One moment, please, for the first question. And our first question is from James West with Evercore ISI. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, Olivia. Morning, James. So, Olivia, uh, five sequential quarters in a row of margin growth and really strong execution. How do you think about or how are you considering or planning for you know, continued strong execution as revenue starts to really accelerate as we go into next year? No, thank you, James, for the question. Indeed, we're very, very proud and very satisfied with uh, the last five quarters. I think they have uh, demonstrated our ability to leverage uh, our, our restructuring, our portfolio high grading, and the foundation we have put in place during this uh, reset we have operated in the last uh, 18 months. But furthermore, I think the looking forward as the cycle will unfold, I think there are two or three characteristics that are that will play favorably and that will help us continue to expand the margin as we have seen in the last quarter. Okay. So first, I believe that the, uh, the market outlook will create favorable market uh, environment, uh, exposing uh, the, the basins where we have a strong position internationally uh, and in particular Middle East or offshore as I, as I commented during my prepared remarks. Um, secondly, I believe that uh, performance still matters and will matter increasingly, hence our technology offering, fit for basin, transition technology, and integration capability will continue to make a, a huge impact and will create a premium for our service in both well construction, reservoir performance, and production system. Digital, will see an acceleration going forward, as we have seen that we have continued to evolve, progress, and mature our digital platform strategy, and we are in the last innings of developing this uh, strategy on the platform, on the foundations. Hence, we are now seeing increased adoption and acceleration. And we expect, as I, as I shared uh, earlier, that uh, this will be increasingly accretive to growth and earnings going forward. And finally, as the revenue, uh, as the activity both internationally and in North America will, uh, will increase, uh, this will tighten the market and create the condition for pricing. So when you combine sure. this uh, favorable market exposure, the track record we have, the technology adoption that give us a premium, and a performance differentiation integrated contract with digital, you have the formula for uh, supporting our ambition for 
25% uh, or higher EBITDA margin by mid-cycle. Right. Okay. Great. That's very helpful, Olivier. And then maybe a follow-up on that. On the digital side, this this will be the first cycle where we really see digital as a big part of, of the business. Um, there's been, you know, as you as you alluded to, widespread adoption, but we haven't yet seen a growth cycle with that adoption. So how do you think that plays out? Is it going to allow you? I mean, obviously margins will be part of it. Does it allow you to grab more market share? I mean, what are the what does digital do in in an up cycle uh, that is especially a, a strong one like uh, we're projecting? I think I will highlight three things that will uh, be the result of uh, our success and our, and our investment and leadership in okay. digital. First, obviously, is the acceleration of uh, digital adoption by customer through our workflow, data, and digital operation offering. And you are seeing element of this being announced every quarter, and you will continue to see this unfolding across the different customer groups and uh, across different uh, geographies. So this will mean a critical growth in 2022 to our top line by the digital, by the digital offering we have. Um, the second aspect is the long tail effect beyond the cycle. I believe that uh, the effect is uh, certainly will last considering the, the very significant size of our customer portfolio. Uh, the fact that customers are uh, going into it uh, over the long run we are seeing a multiple effect of revenue stream uh, being uh, deployed uh, across uh, multiple quarters and multiple years across the different customer group we are addressing. And finally, this is uh, generating uh, margins uh, fall through that are creative to earnings and will be uh, and continue to help us operate uh, DNI at uh, both 30% uh, or mid 30s, and also will uh, result into our ability to extract from digital operation and our own operation, partially integrated performance in well construction weather performance, uh, the ability to extract more efficiency and hence to expand and support margin expansion on those divisions. Very, very good. Thanks, Louis. Thank you. Our next question is from David Anderson with Barclays. Please go ahead. <clears throat> Hi, good morning. Um, I want to ask you a couple of questions about the unconventional contracts that you announced in Saudi and Oman. Um, so could you just help us understand the pricing mechanisms there? Are, are these lump sum? Is there a baseline of, of stages per day? And also just curious where you're sourcing all this equipment. Do you have all this equipment? Does it require capital? Just a, a little bit more background on these contracts, please. Thank you. I think the, this uh, contract, a uh, uh, large integrated contract that uh, we have been winning on our value proposition based on performance on demonstrated efficiency and ability to deploy technology that make an impact on execution. So we do have the capacity in place. We have demonstrated to pilots and or to engagement that we had before that we could deliver uh, the required performance that uh, the customers are expecting. And we have priced it accordingly. And we have demonstrated during the last, uh, the last few years that we have improved our ability to engage, uh, digitalize our operation and work with customers to get this integrated contract, be it LSTK or, or other, to be, to be uh, 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 performing and, uh, and delivering the, the margins and, and earnings we, we need. So we will continue to extract value from, from this, uh, from this uh, contract over the, the period of time. So we are very proud of uh, winning those contracts. They are based on performance, they are based on technology, and our team on the ground. They have done a great job of demonstrating we could take these contracts and create value for customers and, uh, and for ourselves. And, and then in terms of the equipment required, do, do you need to add equipment? Do you, have, do you need to build out at all? No, we have started to, to mobilize uh, this equipment so that we have already in place. And obviously, uh, uh, this will pull equipment from over a uh, place where we have, but uh, we have the equipment in place and we're able to to deliver upon the upon the committed uh, contract we have uh, we are taking on both okay, Oman and, uh, and in Saudi. And, and so and my, my my other question is around offshore. You, you seem to be a bit more optimistic than most on the offshore market. You announced several awards recently. Are, are you confident enough to say we're at an inflection point? You think in offshore spend, which I would think would be quite accretive to your margins with higher utilization and wide subsea and. Also, all the technology you have in well construction, and you also mentioned digital as well. Could you just kind of talk a little bit about maybe kind of how you're seeing this in, in, um, unfolding over the next year or so? Yeah, I think um, um, 
I remain uh, constructive about the offshore environment for, for a couple of reasons. First, uh, because this offshore environment has been strengthening uh, steadily uh, for the last uh, few quarters, and has been the, the rig activity has been uh, increasing uh, lately. And I think we have uh, in the offshore international market gold been going in the, in the mid-teens uh, uh, year on year in, in H2 over H2. So that, that's a proof that this activity is translating into revenue opportunity. And uh, I think the, the, the offshore markets, both uh, particularly internationally, have been growing and rebounding in the last, uh, the last uh, four to two to four quarters. But now looking ahead and looking at the, at the activity, we see a lot of uh, uh, leading indicator. Uh, first, the FIDs. If you look at uh, uh, the actual FID of this year, or if you look at the projection of, uh, of uh, uh, some of the Woodmark projection recently published, showing that uh, there will be an excess of $100 billion of uh, offshore FID, uh, most likely sanctioned by the end of this year, and that will almost double next year. And uh, out of this, 50% uh, of that will be deep water. So there is an acceleration of FID uh, back to the 2019 level that is uh, on the horizon. And that is a result of, uh, of uh, IOCs going to exploit the advantage basin and uh, focusing on the hubs. Uh, the national, uh, national oil company exploiting and unlocking the, 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 the oil and gas reserve uh, to participate to the supply. And finally, uh, there has been a lot of, uh, lot of assets changing trading hands mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the last, uh, in the last uh, uh, few, uh, few quarters. And this, um, this international independent are also pursuing uh, accelerated FID in different basins where they exposed. And the result of that is subsea backlog uh, is, is growing. Uh, we are definitely above one uh, book to bill ratio. And we will certainly be uh, growing year on year in excess of 30 or 40 percent of booking from uh, 2021, 2020 to 2021. So we are indeed uh, quite, uh, quite positive and, and constructive, and this plays very well to our portfolio because this is where well construction was our performance in exploration appraisal in, in large uh, offshore contracts are getting the benefit, and it was very visible during the third quarter. So you could take this as a proxy of the future. Thank you, Olivier. You're welcome. And our next question is from Chase Mulvahill with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, good morning, guess, Chase. Uh, good morning. I guess first thing, I, I kind of, you know, a, a macro kind of higher level question about kind of this investment cycle. You know, there seems to be this growing narrative out there that uh, the oil and gas industry is going to continue to underinvest this cycle, given you know the discipline narrative of the EMP industry and also kind of this energy transition focus. Um, and you know, obviously, you you talk to you know more EMP um, and, and oil and gas producers than probably anybody worldwide. Um, and, and so, given the commentary that you expect exceptional growth in a multi-year cycle in the oil and gas industry. It, this obviously, you know, um, uh, uh, leads uh, you to believe that there's not going to be this underinvestment going forward. So maybe if you can kind of provide some color around this, some thoughts around the disconnect between some investor perception that you're not going to see in a reinvestment cycle, um, you know, uh, going forward. I think the condition I, I set uh, is a unique combination that we are living with. We are living with, uh, uh, from the result of um, underinvestment in the last uh, five to seven years, uh, combined with um, a reset that we have experienced in industry during 2020, and uh, also uh, an elevated capital discipline party in North America. When you combine this and look at the demand outlook that will surpass uh, through, the, through the GDP uh, growth uh, expected for the next two or three years, that will surpass the 2019 level uh, sometime uh, next year. I think uh, the result of which will create a pull on international supply and will create uh, a, a necessity for reinvestment in, in, our, in our industry. So the question are, are very simple. There is a, an anticipated deficit of, uh, of supply if there is no reinvestment in turn into our industry. We have seen that uh, many uh, NOCs have signaled that they are uh, set to reinvest into their capacity going forward. 
the IOCs are reconcentrating on their advantage basins. They will not be the one leading the growth in this cycle, but they will be the one pursuing still the advantage basin to generate the cash they need to transition to new energy. The independents are taking benefit of this position, have inherited some, uh, some uh, uh, prolific assets and are redeveloping those assets with our support and the support of the entire industry uh, to participate to the supply. So I think uh, the, the conditions are set undoubtedly that uh, this demand will have to be, uh, to be met with supply and this supply cannot come with uh, inventory, cannot come with only releasing the OPEX spare capacity. More will have to be built, hence it will uh, create uh, activity growth in the coming, coming years. And it's, a, and it's not only a shot in, in 2022. Uh, this uh, FID I talked about, this capacity expansion in the Middle East, a uh, long-term project that will have a long-term effect beyond the 22-23 horizon. Okay, all right, that's perfect. Uh, just one quick follow-up, uh, just with some clarification on your guidance, um, you know, fourth quarter. I think you said flat uh, margins. Um, was that flat consolidated margins or was that flat for each segment? In other words, if you run the mix, could actually Somebody. margins, because favorable mix, could margins be up? No, no, Chairs, we, we don't disclose uh, and we don't guide on down to the granular uh, division. I think we are, we are talking about the uh, flattish uh, uh, um, uh, margin, global margin, uh, and uh, in, a, in a sense, uh, uh, maintaining very, very high margin and exiting, uh, and exiting in a, in a, in a mid-teens uh, globally for the company as operating margins and the same level of uh, EBITDA margin. So that, that's the, 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 what matters for us is the exit rate uh, and the implication of this exit rate as we enter 2022 as a platform, as a foundation for margin expansion going forward. So the mix is, uh, is uh, giving us this result of, uh, of uh, flat or about uh, uh, mid-teens margin, and that, that's, uh, that's what we ambition. And we are very proud of, of this, uh, maintaining this level of margin. Okay, perfect. I'll turn it back over. Thanks, Olivier. Thank you. Our next question is from Arun Jarayam with J.P. Morgan Chase. Please go ahead. Yeah, my first question is, Olivier, uh, you know, there's three to four million barrels of uh, productive capacity offline from OPEC. And as the, the cartel methodically brings back this output called in for KBD increments, I wanted to get your thoughts. Is, is this creating any near-term uh, service opportunities for you? And I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate on any shifts um, globally in spending from maintenance capex type spending to growth and productive capacity, oil and gas, and what this means for Schlumberger? Yeah, I think uh, as the OPEC Plus will continue to release um, this increment of oil to the market uh, to, to, uh, to be behind, uh, behind the supply curve, behind the demand curve, um, but we are continuing to see uh, an increase of uh, intervention activity, short cycle activity, that uh, is starting to materialize in the, in the, uh, in the OPEC Plus uh, 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 countries where we are seeing mobilization of uh, intervention, uh, uh, stimulation, as we have seen, lifting, and uh, production maintenance uh, activity. So that's the, that's the effect on short cycle. This will also include uh, rig uh, remobilization to do some infill drilling to uh, start to uh, support this uh, increment of, uh, of barrels for the country that have the capacity to expand fast. And this will turn into more long cycle as uh, both the gas development is accelerating, and you have seen the uh, uh, Jafoua announcement from, uh, from Saudi, and, uh, and the continuation of uh, large gas in, in the Middle East and elsewhere, as well as the uh, commitment that two or three countries have taken, in the Middle East particularly, around the expansion of uh, production capacity, uh, permanent capacity, uh, towards the horizon of 24, 20, 27, depending on the, on the country. So, what you talk about has an impact on short cycle, but this is an underlying uh, activity growth coming from long cycle as well. And our next question Arun? is from, oh, Arun, do you have any follow-up?
We'll move on, and we'll go to the line of Connor Lina with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, just just on the first point here, I just wanted to return to Chase's question and just think through the, some of the dynamics in the fourth quarter here. So I would I would think with uh, digital being an area that you called out as particularly strong in the fourth quarter, as well as some activity growth that you're expecting, it, it would seem – assuming that supply chain issues aren't getting worse, that you would naturally have some, some expansion in the margin in the fourth quarter. So I'm just curious what, what I'm sort of missing in that framework. What, what, what's your, you know, what type of issues are you no, risking a, or accounting for? No, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mixed effect. I think you have to account for to, to, um, to affect first uh, the production system that had some um, uh, logistics and supply related, uh, related delay in, into delivery will have a, a sizable catch-up in, in, in the fourth quarter, and, and this segment where we are very happy with their double-digit uh, margin and, and, and anticipate for, for margin expansion. This will be in a mix uh, slightly dilutive to our, to our margin overall, um, and that will offset some of the, uh, what you could expect from, uh, from a digital fall-through, uh, where we expect a, a strong, strong uh, end-of-year sales. But uh, also you have to add to the mix uh, the fact that you are uh, in, in going to a seasonal effect in, in northern hemisphere and to lower mix of uh, expression appraisal, that would have an effect on a seasonality of uh, reserve performance. Uh, that is um, something that we that happens uh, every year, and uh, where the, the third quarter is typically the, the high margin quarter due to this uh, favorable offshore expression appraisal mix uh, that uh, declined for one or two quarters before it rebounds uh, strongly. Uh, every every spring, so that that's uh, when you put this mix together, you you result into uh, maintaining uh, the margin at the level uh, we are putting, which is uh, something remarkable, and uh, and entering the 2022 on a, on a high high ground. That's helpful context. Thank you. Um, second one is is a higher level question here. So you, you did have some integrated projects you you disclosed in the press release. As we think about this this portion of your business, I mean, it, it certainly has been characterized by yourself and peers as, as probably the, the later area where we're going to see pricing improvement. But I guess my question is effectively why? Um, you know, it seemed to me that the, the service companies that can really execute that kind of large-scale integrated work is a very short list, and it seems like there's a lot of value to be delivered to the customer from that type of contract. So what, why isn't this an area that we should be more excited about over the next year or two here? No, I think it's, uh, it has remained competitive due to the, to the sheer size of this contract. Um, but until the capacity in the market uh, is, uh, is stretched and is tightening, I think uh, you will see that the market remain competitive on large integrated contracts. But our capital discipline, the uh, activity growing in all basins, uh, is set to, to create a condition for... Uh, for the tightening and hence uh, lifting on the, on the core pricing of our offering. Now, we are still very satisfied with this, uh, these awards because we have demonstrated that we, through integration, uh, through performance, uh, through technology, including digital and, uh, and track record, we have been uh, differentiated in our ability to sustain uh, uh, our performance on those contracts and create the value we need to, uh, to, uh, to elevate the margins. All right, thank you. I'll turn it back. Thank you. And next we have a question from Scott Gruber with Citigroup. Please go ahead. Yes, good morning. Good morning, Scott. Good morning, good morning. morning. Um, Olivia, you're, you're feeling better about your, your mid-cycle 25% plus EBITDA margin target, which seems warranted given the backdrop here. But if I just look at consensus estimates, uh, at least the market believes it would it would take you a while to achieve. So if you kind of extend consensus, assume 10% annual, annual growth in 24, 25, and extend the 30%-ish type incrementals, mar the market is forecasting in, in 22 and, and 23, um, it would actually take about five years to get to 25% plus EBITDA margin. Do you think you can outpace 30% incrementals over the next few years and hit that 25% margin faster than five years? I think first it's not a matter of uh, if but when we we'll eat and exceed this 25% uh, EBITDA. Uh, we have been doing it. We have been delivering over 30% uh, recently. 
the market condition, as we foresee for uh, going forward, as I've commented earlier, are favorable with uh, the right uh, basin and operating environment mix that is favorable to our, our margin, uh, margin mix. Uh, technology adoption, our performance through integration and digital operation, and our creative digital mix, I think, are putting the condition uh, before pricing kicks in. Uh, to give us the, uh, the outlook, a positive outlook and constructive outlook on this, so that uh, we will indeed uh, ambition to achieve this before five years, clearly. And, and, and do you think you can get there without much pricing? The, the pricing gains just always, you know, take a while to, to kind of move across discrete products into into the bundled contracts and then kind of into your, your, yep. your average selling price. Yeah. You know, do you think you can get the other drivers and get there faster without much pricing? So, so some of the some of performance to date, okay, uh, uh, pulling and elevating the performance of our divisions to their highest level in, in three years or more, and restoring uh, through uh, portfolio grading North America, are already a proof that uh, we can move our margins through uh, execution through performance through high grading uh, visibly so can we uh, move uh, uh, forward I think uh, pricing will only accelerate the time by which this will be met but uh, we are still constructive that we will achieve this uh, independently of pricing and that pricing will come as a bonus to elevate beyond 22 25 percent gotcha great to hear thanks for the color Welcome. Our next question is, we're going back to the line of Arun Jirayam. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks Arun, for letting thank me back. You. Thanks for letting me back in. So, Olivia, year to date, you've reduced debt by about $1.5 billion. And I wanted to get your thoughts on how you're thinking about uh, the priorities for free cash flow generation between – cash return, the dividend, uh, and the balance sheet, and also how you're thinking about Slumberjay's investment in, in Liberty now that the lockup recently expired. I'll take this, Arun. Uh, look, our, our immediate priority remains the, the deleveraging of the, of the balance sheet. And, and yes, we've progressed uh, quite well, and we are very happy with it. So, so now we do have a clear line of sight to achieving our two times net debt to EBITDA target leverage, and we said we'll, we should do that by the end of 2022. Uh, we, with the earnings uh, expansion we are expecting in this growth cycle and our continuous focus on capital stewardship, yes, we will continue to generate significant excess cash in the next few years. So this will allow us to, to maintain a, a healthy balance sheet, and it will give us the flexibility to increase returns to shareholders as well as fund new growth opportunities. As it relates to uh, returns to shareholders, this is something we will continue to review with our board of directors as the cycle unfolds and the deleveraging of our balance sheet accelerates. And, and as it relates to new growth opportunities, we will, whether it's in digital, new energy, any new investment, we, we will continue to look at under the strict lens of our returns-based capital stewardship framework. Your question on... Uh, Liberty, uh, clearly we are happy with the transaction we made now more than a, a year ago. We are benefiting from the, 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 the recovery in North America through a, a significant appreciation of our equity stake there. And, uh, and yes, monetization is, uh, is clearly an option. The, the timing, the, the pace, and the magnitude of this monetization will be based on, uh, on the market conditions and, and the outlook, but we'll make sure we'll, uh, we'll optimize it, basically. Thank you. Next, we go to the line of Roger Reed with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Yeah, good morning. Thanks for, uh, good morning. Thanks for having me on here. Um, I guess I'd like to come back to the, the 25% margin goal for EBITDA, but think of it maybe in a, in a slightly different way. You've got, obviously, the typical cyclical recovery uh, you know, so utilization, you'll get some pricing. You talk about digital as one of the big separating factors. And I was wondering if, as you look at the goal to 25, maybe a, a weighting of where you think that could go, you know, if you thought what would be normal for utilization, normal for pricing, and then digital on top, is it a third, a third, a third? Is it 50-50? I'm just kind of curious 
how we should think about that coming through. I think it, it would be difficult to, to give you a, a precise uh, outlook because this will depend on, on every division and almost on every geography depending on, on, on a mixed uh, outlook we, we, we foresee. But suffice to say that I think our voting leverage would need being a, a base for our, our margin expansion to the, the way we execute with efficiency using our own digital transformation to, to uh, execute and extract performance from our execution. So that, that's the base. Uh, Above that, I will, I will place the, the, digital, the, the, the technology first and the technology mix uh, adoption from fit for basin that are highly, highly uh, differentiated and successful in, in all basin. I will include the transition technology that are starting to emerge as a, as a unique differentiator. And I will include uh, also the integration uh, delivery uh, with performance in, in an integration contract. And then, indeed, and you are correct, uh, um, our digital uh, expansion will uh, be favorable uh, on top. So I think you, you have these three, uh, three things, but I, I don't want to be in, a, in starting to be uh, trying to, to uh, uh, create a boundary between these. I don't think it's appropriate. And I think it, it will depend on, the, on every basin and every, uh, every division will have a different trajectory, but we are confident that across the portfolio we have, uh, considering the international mix, considering the offshore, considering the, the technology adoption that is uh, coming back, I think uh, this uh, we have the path forward. Okay, great, thanks. And then uh, just an unrelated follow-up. I was curious. You talked about a lot of major projects and so forth globally. We've seen obviously some pretty <laughs> extreme pricing in LNG and natural gas overall. So if you just kind of looked at natural gas as a as a driver on the project side or the activity side, anything globally you could say you know looks like it's improved over recent months or recent quarters or anything on the the sort of larger project side there that looks um you know well, like i think, I think guys guys is a is a is there for a long um, a long time as a as a critical supply as a as a transition fuel as well so i think uh you see that uh, the existing reserve be it on commercial or conventional offshore and onshore uh, will be commercialized uh, by, by our customers as long as um, they have a path to market through LNG or they have a path to market to pipeline. So we see this accelerating. You have seen some of the critical announcements we made uh, this morning relating to uh, onshore, offshore, unconventional, and conventional uh, gas developments. And we see it as a, as a trend that is not, uh, not about to stop. Now, will it accelerate? I think the the gas uh, supply demand is, uh, is misbalanced this year, will recover a little bit uh, next year, but will continue uh, to its strong, strong trajectory going forward. And you have a few countries that are committed to accelerate their gas transition. India is the most visible one that will uh, step change their, their consumption of gas and will then participate to fuel uh, the gas demand and uh, will, uh, will itself uh, expand in, in gas supply as well uh, domestically. So. Middle East domestic gas, India as, a, as an engine of growth for, for gas beyond the, the, current, uh, the current mix, and, um, and some specific uh, security supply uh, uh, of supply that will uh, trigger some, uh, uh, some gas development uh, from existing gas redevelopment or, or short cycle activity. So I'm, I'm optimistic, hence uh, very, very uh, pleased with the the, the, the gas uh, contract we have been winning this quarter. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question is from Wakar Syed with ATB Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, Olivier, just uh, one uh, broader question. Um, you know, you've given us some good guidance on uh, upstream capital spending uh, for international markets and uh, North American markets for next year. Now, with respect to exploration budgets in particular, do you see the growth rate of exploration spending uh, in line with uh, uh, otherwise uh, global spending or higher or lower? It's too early to, uh, to, give, uh, to give a specific guidance for exploration. What I will say for exploration is that uh, we are seeing two, two things uh, uh, coming back. We are seeing some uh, seismic uh, activity coming back, uh, and including uh, there are some proof that uh, the seismic uh, boat uh, uh, utilization is going. But uh, what is more critical is the near-field exploration 
uh, is, uh, is triggering a, a more activity in exploration going forward as everybody wants to get better return on their existing infrastructure to, to create tiebacks. And hence, we have seen some licensing rounds as well. So licensing rounds, some seismic survey coming back, and uh, exploration, uh, near field exploration for future infill or tieback is what we see. So to give you a magnitude, directionally, it will improve, it will increase, but to give a magnitude, it's too early. Okay. And, and then uh, with respect to uh, the APS business, uh, previously there were some plans for asset divestitures. Uh, are those plans on hold, or are you still pursuing those? Look for uh, work out for APS asset in Canada, which is what we discussed previously. We we have received offers uh, with various commercial constructs, and now we are just in the process of evaluating the the, the potential merits and risk associated with those proposals. Uh, so this is what we are doing now. In the meantime, we are of course managing this asset uh, as to optimize cash flows. Uh, in the current commodity pricing environment, and it, it generates quite a lot of cash flow. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate the, the answers. Welcome. And next we go to the line of Neil Meadow with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Th thanks so much, team. I just want to go back to Arun's question on, on deleveraging. As you think about the right, the optimal capital structure is two times net debt to EBITDA still the, the the normalized way you would think about the business? And, and based on the visibility you have on the cash flow, when do you think you'll be in a position to hit that target? It, it's a good question, Neil. Uh, is is two times uh, the the right level? You could you could argue it's a it's a good level throughout the cycle now in in an up cycle with the cash you generate the excess cash uh, we would probably be happy to go below uh, two times and it will give us the the required flexibility as i said to uh, to to look at growth uh, additional growth opportunities and potential uh, incremental shareholder return so we may not stop at two times uh, we can take this as an, an intermediary step and uh, and uh, we uh, two times will just be an average throughout the cycle. I think is a, uh, is the right level. Yeah, and then, yeah, the the follow up is just on the digital business. You spent a lot of time talking about it on this call, but do you think you'll the company will ever get credit for the digital business, which is highly valuable, terrific margins, embedded within a more volatile uh, services and technology business? Does the company does that asset ultimately belong outside of uh, uh, your your core business? And I look at Emerson and Aspen, the transaction that they recently did to try to be put a better marker on the value of digital. It's a it's a high level question, but I'm curious on what the optimal way to showcase the value of that business is. No, first we will we will continue to pursue. We have made investment into a, a, a digital platform. Uh, we are using it both internally and externally. Uh, we have a, a critical customer that depend upon us and will continue to trust us for the future. So we are using it to accelerate our growth, be creative uh, on our growth and our returns. And whether you are getting the, the right value, I think it's up to you to, uh, to review and, and give us the multiple, uh, the multiple expansion that uh, we deserve for this. I think we have been so far demonstrating uh, uh, enough uh, uh, margins, uh, uh, sustained margin to this. We anticipate the growth to, to now come to, to play visibly in the coming years. And I think uh, our leadership in this is, is recognized. And um, yeah, I will expect that uh, this will be uh, turning into a premium uh, for valuation. Okay. Thank, thanks, Cass. No, thank you. Ladies. So, go ahead, please. I believe it's I believe it's time to call. I'm not sure that we have time for another question. Uh, no further time. You may conclude. Okay. So thank you very much. So I, I would like to conclude the call, and I would like to leave you with a few key takeaways. First, during the third quarter, our growth momentum was sustained, both internally, internationally, and in North America, and drove peer-leading margin expansion, reflecting our operating leverage, advantage market position, and increased technology adoption. We also generated sizable free cash flow, allowing us to materially reduce our net debt. 
Secondly, our performance in execution, our proven integration capabilities, and our differentiated technology and digital portfolio are increasingly resonating with our customers and have resulted in sizable awards in the quarter across Middle East, offshore, and in gas development in particular, all critical markets as the upcycle unfolds. Thirdly, we are confident that the momentum of this upcycle will continue, allowing us to close this year with another quarter of revenue and earnings growth, resulting in full-year sequential growth internationally and pro forma North America, and full-year margin expansion on the high end of our guidance. Finally, with the backdrop of strengthening demand in the energy markets, the macro conditions are increasingly set for an exceptional multi-year growth cycle unfolding broadly during 2022, both internationally in North America and resulting in significant earnings growth potential for emerging. Ladies and gentlemen, I could not be more satisfied with our strategic execution progress to date, the enthusiasm of our entire team and the elevated trust of our customers. I look forward to the coming quarters with increased confidence. Our returns focused strategic execution has created the conditions for unique outperformance in our core and digital offering at the onset of this subcycle, whilst elevating our sustainability commitments and accelerating our new energy strategic initiatives. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude your conference for today. Thank you for your participation and for using AT&T teleconference service. You may now disconnect.